Hello? It's working. Ah, good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing today? Hey, I know we're the last presentation, but we'll try to keep it very short and very exciting as much as possible. Okay. Oh, by the way, my name is um, Tavis Sibeu. I'm from Renault, as you've heard already. So I'll be brief as much as possible. Yes. So what are we here to talk about? We are here to talk about the building leadership and talent pipeline in Rendwood. So what is Rendwood? Well, those who don't know, Rendwood is a water board based in South Africa in Gauteng that provides water to the community. It's around about 114 years old currently. So the question is, how do you now make sure that you keep the talent, you improve the talent going forward for a company that has been around for 114 years, providing potable water to the population of Gauteng and the surrounding areas? So basically what we do is that we focus on a particular that we call the rent water missions. What are those rent water missions? The first part is to attract, develop, retain leading edge skills in the water services. As you can see, we've had the skill very important because that's what we're going to be focusing on. How do we get these skills into the situation and sustain robust financial performance? Because remember, we are a parastatal. We still report to the government. And Department of Water and Sanitation is our boss. So at the end of the day, we need to report in how we do in terms of financial. Develop sustainable global competitive capabilities in the core areas. And to be able to do that, you need to be able to attract the right skills into the organization. And develop those who are already within the organization to make sure that you are able to meet that competitive capabilities. Enter into sustainable productive partnership. That is another goal that we're looking at in terms of the organization. Develop, test, deploy cost-active technologies. Now, you can hear people here, they've been talking about that a lot. How do you come up with the technology? We have a dedicated department that does, deals with that in terms of developing new technologies for the organization. We don't only depend on what is coming from outside. We are also having our own innovation within the organization. Right. So, the skill development initiative, what do we do in, in Rand Water? Right. We look at the skill development facilitators and talent consultant management. They work together to make sure that the organization is aligned with what we call the OFO, Organization Framework in Occupation. Those who deal with CETAs will understand what does that mean. And we also look in terms of legislative work, functions, and Section 26 D initiative, looking at 18.2s and 18.1s. What do we mean about that? We're actually talking about the people that are currently employed in the organization, which are 18.1s, and we also look at 18.2s. Those are the people that are employed, that we bring it in and give them the skills so they can be able to share that skills with other organizations. And we also look at what we call the pivotal training, which is your professional, vocational, technical, and also uh, learning that we look at in terms of our developed skills initiatives. And we also initiate responsible to management consistency in progress design and development. So management also plays a very big role in terms of what direction do we need to take as an organization looking at the innovation that is currently happening out there in so, how do we get our funding to do all these programs, to run all these programs? Well, we work hand in hand with our EW CETA, which is the CETA where we, that we respond to. We have what we call the discretionary and the mandatory grant. The mandatory grant it depends mostly on what we call the WSP. That's a work skills plan that we need to formulate as an organization and submit to the CETA. Then the CETA will be able to fund us on that. But we do not wait for the CETA to start. We also start the funding ourselves internally while the CETA is still busy with approving our WSP, which is then also we involve unions in that process because we don't just take the process from management. It also has to come from the employees because they know what they need in terms of developing themselves. And then also we look at the discretionary grant. This part of a grant, it's you apply for it in your CETA. They will advertise, then you'll apply depending on what you have. But the mandatory depends mostly on your WSP, which is the work skills plan that fills the SSP, the sector skills plan of your CETA. So what are the programs that we are currently running in the organization? We have a number of programs. We have what we call learnerships that we are running in the organization. We also have artisan training under the section D. And we also provide bursaries. So we have BASA students that we provide bursaries to. That later on, I'll explain what happens to those BASA students after they finish with the program. We also have what we call a graduate or an internship program that we run. This is now part of bringing in the new skills that are actually coming from the universities, coming into the organization. Because in Rendota, we're literally looking at about a very low staff turnover. Most employees in Rendota, we're looking at 20 to 25 years of experience in the organization. So we have an old staff members that are involved in 
rainwater. So we do need fresh mines that are coming in through. And this is part of the process that we use in doing that. And we also have what we call the leadership program that we run in the organization. As I said, 20 years, 50 years, we have people that started working in rainwater back in 93, 94. They are still working. The, and those are aging workforce. So we kind of use them in terms of leadership programs, how to train the new upcoming staff in the organization. Right. So how is this done? Because if you look at rainwater, we are around about 4,500 employees currently. Around about 5,000 employees. How do you do that? Do Thank you, Kitty. <laughs> That's Kitty Bone, our coordinator. Right. <laughs> so we look at that. So how do we coordinate this training in this huge organization of that we are? We have this model that we use in the organization where most of the capacity building, they sit on that section. Then we have what we call the EDT practitioners. Now, the EDT practitioners are based on sites. They are the ones that deals with Sorry about that. With the management, the, all the employees, they deal with daily basis employees, understanding their needs. What is that they need in order for them to be upskilled in this sector? So we make sure that we keep that relationship working. And we also have what we call the ops trainers. These are the people that are responsible for the operations. They deal with all process controllers in the organization. We have around about 162 process controllers in the organization. So these guys, they deal with them, the ops trainers. And we also have the risk trainers because as a production line, we have high risk in the organization. So we have those dedicated people looking at that risk. So we as capacity building, we sit in this section where we have different streams. So based on the need of the organization, they communicate that with the EDT practitioners who then decides and look at which stream will they be able to get assistance in elder to help business. Now, training comes in both ways, if you can see. Sometimes training can also come straight from capacity building from top to bottom. So training is done in that way, you bottom to top and then top to bottom training. That was happened. But that is done via the EDT practitioners that are on site to deal on daily basis. And between that, we also have what we call a personal development plan. This is what now the employees will fill in during the end of the year to prepare for the next financial year. They will fill those documents. And those PDPs are also linked to what we call a performance contract where an employee will sit down with the manager and they discuss, have you delivered on what you were expected to deliver in that financial year? So there, they're able to identify gaps and see what is actually happening. Then that information is transferred to what we call a PDP, which is then used in terms of developing their skills. Right, so the pipelines that we currently have in the organization, we have pipeline one, two, and three, as you can see, where we take in Pasari students for 36 months. So we fund students for 36 months. The second pipeline is what we call an experiential training. We take in students from universities to come into the process and be trained. We also look at graduate development program that runs for 24 months. And we also have pipeline number four, which is the retention program. So we don't just train the graduates and then release them. It happens at point in time that we retain some of the, depending on the need of the business. Now the need is driven by the managers on site that they still need these graduates and that will, I'll explain it later. And then we also have this another pipeline where we deal with learnerships. Remember, we talked about innovation and bringing in new ideas in an organization that is 114 years with more than 25, uh, sorry, with more than 20 years of experience of a lot of staff. So we do also learnership as part of the pipeline to have people already so that when our staff goes for retirement, we already have people that are trained with our processes to be able to fill in that gap. And we also have process controllers, our own process controllers, because we don't say because you're 45 that you've done, you've achieved your training. We also continue training our process controller for going to the future. So the graduate program system, this is how it goes. We have five phases in the program. The first phase where we deal with acquisition of the graduate, recruitment, we have induction. Now the induction is done internal and external. The induction is done by the internal employees and we also involve external employees and external uh, service providers. And most of our service pro external service providers are institutions that we have professional chairs with, like TUT, University of Pretoria. So during the induction of our graduates, we bring them over to help induct the graduates in terms of what we're going to be doing. And the project runs for 24 months. And each graduate, this is a very key important part now in attending graduates, is that we make sure that each graduate has a coach and a mentor. 
Now, this process doesn't happen when we've already acquired the graduate. This happens before we can go and look for a graduate because each department identifies its own needs. Then it's able to dedicate certain individuals who are going to become coaches and mentors. And most graduate programs, they usually fail in that process. As myself, too, I'm a product of a graduate program, but I can tell you I never had a coach, I never had a mentor. I came into work and I was told, this is what we do, move on. I had to find a way in that graduate program for myself to learn more. But some of my friends and colleagues that I started with, they didn't have the same opportunity. So this now becomes a very, very important part to make sure. And then in the next phase, we have what we call panel reviews. So the graduates are in the process, they are doing the job, but we have panel reviews where we review what they are doing, if it's still in line with what was the objective from the beginning, from business. And that is done every 12 months in that 24 months to understand. That now will assist in terms of the retention. Depending on how the person does during the panel review, we then now that the department will then decide whether they will keep the graduate or they will release the graduate and extend the process. So the process is usually around about 18 months in terms of that process. So what have, how have we been doing so far? You can see the numbers, they are right there. So far, in terms of the graduates, 2015, 2016, we had 50 graduates that came in, and then we had 24 in terms of the learnerships, 83 in 2016, 27. Currently, we are sitting at 106 in terms of how many graduates we have within Randwater currently, and around about 21 in terms of the learnerships. So, how has things been happening? Well, in all those numbers that you see, you can see how many we have retained. Those that are not retained, it doesn't mean that they are out of job. We usually have a 99% success rate of employment. Most of our graduates that we've taken in and they've left Randwood, they have gotten employed by other organizations. But within the organization, in terms of leadership, we have 18 that we've taken in, and then we have seven graduates that are currently employed in the organization, and that is 2014, 2015. And currently, we have eight learners that come from the leadership that are employed by the organization and two graduates that are currently employed by the organization. So you can see that we do take in certain people during that process. And then we have, as I said earlier on, you have processes that come from capacity building, which is head office. You have programs that are influenced by the employees from the bottom. So we have one of the problems that we run in the organization, which is called process controller training. Now this came from an audit that was done by the Department of Water Affairs. I'm sure we're all aware of what something called a blue drop. Are we? Have you heard about it? Blue drop. Okay. There is a program that the Department of Water Affairs runs in monitoring and making sure that the water quality that is provided in South Africa is of good standard. So the program is called the blue drop. The initiative comes from the blue flag, you know the nice sandy beaches that we have here, blue flag, which informs international people that the waters are safe for them to come and swim. So it's the same program. So on that program we have that system of process controllers that we train and sorry about that. Okay, so the programs we have RPL that we're running, learnership skills program, something called grand parenting, and we're also on the job training. That's how we train now our process controllers, the core on the business. Those are just the numbers I wanted to show you in terms of how many people have we trained in terms of the learnerships, the RPL, and something called grand parenting. It's something very new in some industries that people are not quite aware of, but you can ask me more details on that program after when we're having that nice wine. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, my name is Zipo. I'm Chief. Um, I would actually be presenting around the leadership development within rainwater. All right, uh, moving along. I saw that, you know, we're running out of time. Okay, first thing, I think we need to understand what does that mean to be a leader at rainwater. We're not just actually developing leaders that would be generic and that would can, or that can actually fit into any industry. We've got our own brand and we've got our own competencies that are predefined to say, this is the leader that we need at Rainwater. And that leader, trust me, it's very unique. If it goes to any industry, trust me, it would be very different to the leader that you currently have. And if you look at those three pillars there, that's basically what defines a leader within Rainwater. We need people that are value creators. We need people that are business operators. We need people that are people developers. What does that mean to be value creator? We need people that proactively, you know, define and offers innovation. So as you can see, skill summit, innovation, innovation, 
the future world of work. That's what we're also heading towards. Right, and then the people developers, as you can see, skills development, encompassing, sorry, um, coaching and also developing people. It's one of the key drivers that we actually encourage our leaders to do across the board. So now our leaders, we encourage them to do as like coaching and mentoring. Then people developers, we need people that are actually profitable driven. So as the organization grows, we are saying, look, we still need to be sustainable. How do we then generate profit? How do we actually generate money so that we can be sustainable, sustainable in the future? So those are actually some of the key. If you were to actually ask what defines a leader in rainwater, those are the three pillars that gives you an answer. Right, now the question would be, what is the strategy that we have adopted in terms of now implementing and developing our leaders? If you look at the first, uh, sorry, this slide, we have actually adopted an integrated approach from an organization, in, sorry, organizational in leadership um, effectiveness. If you look at that, what we normally do is we first look at the vision of the organization. What direction is the organization taking? And we look at the vision, we look at the strategy. From there, we then define the competencies per each and every strategic objective of the organization. And we define the competencies per each level of leadership. We've got different levels of leadership. That actually gives you the brand that we spoke about, which is now being the people developer, being the, um, um, the value creator and the business operator. So, as part of the strategy in terms of developing leaders, what we normally do, we don't just thumbsack the programs that we actually provide to our leaders. There's a rigorous process that we undergo where we do a lot of pre, either assessments and analysis. There's a lot of other programs that are happening in the business where there's assessments and also there are other evaluations in terms of now checking or gauging the appetite of the business. If you look at that, we talk about employee engagement, how engaged are the employees. We get that, we get the reports, we get to analyze, and then we specifically zoom into leadership to say what are the issues that we need to address specifically for leadership. Then from there, we're gonna be able to derive some of the programs that we will then um, implement going forward. There are capability assessments, your 360, you can name them. There's quite a lot, but that to us, it's basically you know, an input in terms of now defining or developing the programs moving forward. Along that process, there's also a process that is happening within the, organization, sorry, the organizational design and development space, where now you look at the leadership charter that defines what leaders in the country, what leaders in the water sector, what are the competencies, what are the, some of the qualities that are needed. And we also look at uh, the processes and also the, the, the systems that are happening. How do we actually have the seamless and you know, uh, effective processes within the organization? And our leaders, most definitely, they need to be in tune and they need to drive that process from a leadership point of view in order for other people, which is the masses, for them to follow. They also, actually, we take into, consider into consideration that information to say, how does that actually influence some of the things that we are doing in the business? Or how does that actually define or be the input in terms of moving forward for the programs that we want to deliver in the organization? Once that has happened, we are then able to identify the gaps. Remember, we've got the competencies that are predefined. Then now we get into the people to say, what are the competencies that you have? We mirror that to the competencies that have been defined already. Then we are able to identify the gaps. Then each and every leader would then be sent to a program that is target specific. You don't just get a leader that goes into any program. Yes, we do also partner with business institutions where now we get off the shelf. But however, we try by all means to tailor the program so that they are rainwater specific. Business cases, they are rainwater because Normally what happens is as part of measuring the returns, especially I think in the skills development space, it's very difficult to quantify in rents and cents, more especially in the space that I'm currently in, in parastatals, where now you actually measure on spend. It's very difficult. So what we normally do is we introduce what we call as like action learning projects, where now leaders would go into a particular project or a program with the aim for them to actually implement a particular project that would have an impact into the business. All right. Um, yeah, but 
the idea with this whole integrated model, I can see that I'm running out of time. As you can see, GBC also spoke about the performance. This whole process, it's actually linked to the performance management system that we have in the organization, where now we are able to make as like each and every leader to account, because remember, if it's not part of your performance, then it's very easy for you to just say, you know what, I'm not gonna do that. But if you look at this whole integrated process, it actually talks to what? Driving the, the business performance. That's where we actually heading by this whole thing. Right. So I think the next slide is basically to show the competency framework, the leadership competency framework that I've been actually making reference to. This is how it looks like. As you can see, we've got all those competencies. They are about 22. There was a rigorous process that we have actually undergone, um, that we have actually taken to come up with these competencies where each and every business leader in the organization, including the masses, they were actually engaged to say, tell us, what is your ideal leader at Rainwater? What are some of the competencies that you would like to see each and every leader displaying as part of their day-to-day -day lives. Then we came up with all those. Those are the strategic objectives of the organization. As you can see, we have actually defined and linked each and every competency to each and every strategic objective of the organization. Then going across on those two, we, what we did is we then mapped those competencies per different levels. And if you look at those different levels, they're actually linked to the SSTs, which is the stratified theories. Stratified, uh, stratified systems theory, which then actually describe the level of complex, complexity. So that's what we did. All right. So this is just an example of a leadership um, development competency. Then, part of that, we also came up with this, which actually enables engagement. This enables the engagement from a leadership point of view in terms of we've got different levels, and we also try to link this with your is like known kind of like a leadership pipeline by Drota to say a particular level of leaders, this is kind of like a catalog that they can tap into, or these are the programs at a particular level that they can actually look at in terms of development. But this is not a current stone, they are quite a number, but we just thought, let us make an example of, you know, um, yeah, this leadership development um, ladder of learning. All right, this is just to show the numbers. As you can see, we've got different programs, some are off the shelves. I can see that the picture is not, I think it's blurry. You can't see the, the actual programs, but this is just to show in terms of how we gradually then uh, try to develop our leaders. As you can see the graphs. Right, all right, yeah. I think in closing, I would like to leave you with that quote by Simon Sinek. Leadership is not about being in charge. It is about taking care of those in your charge. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the reps of Rand Water. We're now going to open questions to the floor. Um, just to... to Okay, thank you very much. I see you, sir. That's number one. Anybody else for questions? Two. Anybody else? Three. Fantastic. Ah, what is a serious issue? Ne? <laughs> Four. Okay, noted. I think um, just to begin the session, of course, you are all open to answer. Thank you very much for that informative presentation. I think it's very critical. You know, what is a commodity and... Um, you know, the big concern that I have as, as also a young person is that Water as a commodity is, is now being privatized. We see countries like Zambia um, that have privatized their water supply. We're going into, in, in Ghana as well, also Malawi is, is around their talks. How do you then equip these leaders to deal with crises like that? And, and how do we then address such issues, especially in the space that you're in as an entity that does report to government? So I, I'd like to start with that. And then perhaps, um, can we give number one uh, the mic. Ah, ready. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, sir. You can go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm always very fascinated by soft skills and uh, just to get your perspective around 
what's working in your learning programs from a soft skills point of view, what is most beneficial to the learners? Thank you. Um, good presentation. I think it was really good. Two questions. What are your targets? Because I see you do a lot of things. And what are your budgets? Okay. Thank you. Number okay. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I assume that when actually rainwater was conceived, you know, it had to deal with, with the mines in the, you know, in Gauteng. And water was still in abundance, and now it's a scarce resource. And when you go to the township, people, you know, waste a lot of water. Do you have any program to empower those people on how to use water sparingly? Because you might actually have skills internally only to find that water is being wasted in the township. Thank you. Sure. Powerful question. All right, the last question, right at the back. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, my first question, you mentioned earlier that you involve your trade unions when you identify skills gaps within the organization. So my question is, to what extent do you capacitate your trade unions uh, to an extent that when they give that advice, they've got an understanding of a bigger fi picture, your NSD strategy and the skills development, you know, act. And uh, you mentioned that, and the reason why I'm asking the following question is because our company is involved in gender mainstreaming and disability mainstreaming in both private and public sector. So my question is, with your CSI project, do we have, do you have evidence of women people with disability that you have um, trained and later use them as businesses, you know, where you've provided them with business skills, where they can render a service back to, you know, to rent water. Okay, thank you for that. So over to you, um, members of the panel. Okay, thank you for those questions. Uh, Thought-provoking, um, and some of them are going to give us uh, some time to think about certain strategies that we do. So I'm going to start with the soft skills uh, from the gentleman there at the back. You know, Renwater was, um, like the other gentleman alludes to, was essentially a technical company. So we, we started off with the aim of providing clean drinking water to everybody, portable water. And um, so when you look at every other area of Renwater, it arose from the need of being a a company that can provide much more, right? Um, so when you look at soft skills, in the last five years, Rainwater has started to develop in-house uh, soft skills. So mm. trainers and service providers within that can provide soft skills. We currently have um, a gentleman employed that is focusing purely on soft skills. So it was not necessarily uh, done in-house previously, but we are now um, ensuring that we have the internal skill to provide soft skill. Obviously, you get external people coming in. Somebody comes in and does maybe emotional intelligence, customer services, but they cannot necessarily speak the rainwater language. So um, we're now learning that it's best to get your in-house service providers so that they talk to the people right where they are. Okay. Have we answered you? You happy with that? Okay. Uh, budget. In terms of the normal skills uh, process, you know, 1% of the labor budget would go towards skills development in terms of the CETA requirement. Rainwater actually exceeds that uh, in terms of uh, creating the budget for skills development. And most of um, what we do at Rainwater is funded within, and we have CETA support as well. Uh, but IOC is very, very committed to um, ensuring that the labor force is skilled to do the jobs that they are required to do. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, am I audible now? <laughs> yes. 
totally. That, that's our job to make you audible. <laughs> to deal with the water. Yeah. All right. Um, in terms of maybe let, just let's just to um, tackle the one around um, uh, unions, right? The within Rain Doctor, what, what what we did is we we have actually formulated, I think also as per the skills development requirements or legislation, what we call the the training committees. And how Rain Doctor set up is uh, we've got sites and then we've got a corporate. So now, in most cases, what happens is we've got labor representative that normally sit in those particular committees, which is the, the training committees, and we've got training committees per each site, where now they talk about, um, they talk about training related issues. And uh, I need to safely say, when it comes to the actual, you know, um, you know, spade work in terms of the, the needs analysis, they're not that actively involved because we've got the ETDPs, I think as Mkabisi have already alluded that we've got ETDPs that are the eyes and the ears of the capacity, which is they are the ones that then engage with the business in terms of doing that whole is like skills audit. And the hope is they actually engage with the business and as part of the business, labor is also part of the business. Okay. Empowerment. All right. Uh, the empowerment of, oh, sorry, the empowerment of the committee, I think when we started formulating that, we, we then ran what we call as like a, a workshop where now we kind of like uh, train them on the language of skills development. And from time to time, we've got a group SDF which would then come and present in such committees in terms of what's actually happening. What are the changes? How is the new learning and development or skills development landscape is shaped? So that's how we then actually uh, share information around skills development. Okay, just to add on, on what Zips have just said uh, in terms of how do we empower our community, we also have a department uh, waterways within the organization that certainly looks at uh, outreaching the communities. So it offers uh, the programs for school children and any other individuals who wants to know anything relating to water. So yeah, just also myself to add on that. We also have another department called Rand Water Foundation that does a lot of work with the community in terms of empowering them in how then they come and support the organization. So that Rand Water Foundation plays a very pivotal role in training people who currently going to be running a leadership on agriculture. That is part of what we do in the organizations. We're empowering the, the community. And we have a stream in one of our streams as, as, as capacity building that says giving back to the community. So we also do that. And we have a lot of SMEs that we employ in the organization to assist us with some of the training, as Mrs. Kavenda says. So, so we don't solely run everything ourselves. We do a lot of that. But now in terms of the dis disabled, the disabled... Uh, on that part disability in terms of uh, empowering um, employees with disabilities um, Randwater is very serious about in maintaining the equity uh, for for the region for the country sure. so we not only monitor uh, disability employment uh, for the organization per section per manager actually we um, we measure it against the demographic of the, the the province and thereafter our supply area and holistically the country. So our our focus uh, has been over the years to always have programs that specifically target learners with disability. Our current program is targeting uh, disabled learners in the electrical field. So okay. we not only uh, share soft skills, the way we employ people as receptionists and so on, we also um, have learners with disability in the technical fields. Um, we have a lot of learners that we have trained um, that actually are retained within the organization and, and a lot are sought by other sectors to be able to be employed. Um, in terms of the women as well, empowering women, disabled women and women in general in Randwater, we take that very seriously. 
Um, we believe that women leadership is important. Our current targets in just the division I'm in um, exceeds, um, you know, more than 20% what the, the target of the organization is. So managers okay. take employing females very seriously and ensuring that females attend leadership programs at whatever level they are. Um, the leadership desk not only gives you genetic programs, it also customizes programs for specialist scientists and people like that. So you may have a scientist that is in terms of academic level at NKF level 10, but maybe at a leadership level of about NKF level 7 and 8. So we cater at, at the specific level that the uh, female is at. Okay, thank you. I think there was one more question here yes, about the community. communities. How do we okay. sensitize them to save um, water? Uh, Ranwater's uh, primary program is the WaterWise program, and that WaterWise program reaches out to the community directly, meaning we have schools on a regular basis. We have um, uh, three s uh, sites for our WaterWise team where we have schools visiting them on a daily basis. We even have schools that come on the weekends that we uh, train. So we, uh, we target th the child because the child goes back into the community and teaches the parent. Um, and um, and that is the easiest way to spread the message as quickly as possible at the lowest level in the community. Um, so that is a very big uh, uh, area for Randwater, and we put we pump in a lot of money. We create a lot of publicity around that. Um, if you get onto our website and you look for the WaterWise team and you look at all of the things that they are doing, you will see that they have community projects, garden projects, empowering of your aged and so on. So you're gonna find a lot of excellent programs that they do. We also have um, other areas of business that enable uh, community. So you would get uh, people um, requesting funds, requesting services from Rainwater, and we would get out there and assess the need and we would then help uh, communities to start off projects. We have a lot of um, drives in terms of starting food gardens and so on sure. in underprivileged areas. Okay, fantastic. Do you want to? Yeah, just, just okay. to add on. When you comment, uh, it's your closing remark. Okay, <laughs> so we're going to have our closing remarks now. Um, Okay, just to add on when it comes to touching the community, uh, we also have uh, some forums whereby we involve municipalities, okay. especially that we are partnering with or uh, that uh, touches our area of supplies. Okay. So those forums, normally we engage with them on a monthly basis. Okay. Yes. Sure. Uh, that's how you conclude. <laughs> All right. No, thank you. <laughs>